All right, video lecture two, reading the periodic table. When we first take a look, the individual cells on the periodic table, remember, it gives us a bit of information. It tells us the atomic mass, the atomic number, and we can also use this location of the cell on the periodic table to help us figure out the electron configuration. The 80 is the, atomic, is the atomic number. Remember, that's the number of protons that are found in the nucleus. It's unique to all of our elements. Our atomic mass is the larger number with the decimal. If we round it to the whole number, we get the mass number, which is the sum of the protons and neutrons. Now, we also have groups and fa or families and periods on the periodic table. So if we take a look at our if we take a look at a blank periodic table, these groups, these vertical columns are called groups. Remember, columns go up and down if you remember if you've ever taken a look and seen columns like this, especially like in ancient Greece or stuff like that of court buildings, these columns run up and down. Our columns, our groups, run up and down. However, periods, periods are the rows. So the rows on the periodic table. When you row in a boat, the boat moves horizontally. When you row, it doesn't make the boat go up and down, it makes it move horizontally. So as we start on one side and move across, we have a period. One of the other ways, one of the other ways that I tend to think about this is if I'm going to write my schedule. Okay, period A, I have zoology. Period B, I have chemistry. So what you say is, as I say my period. I see my period and I look across. I still group things accordingly. I group things into the same column because these are my classes and this is the time frame. These are all the time frames in which I have those classes. So when I read my schedule, my period goes across but I group them according to time, which is my A, B, C, Ds, and my classes, zoology, chemistry, etc. Now, we have some different classes of elements on the periodic table. The first class is the metals. We also have the nonmetals, or the semi, the nonmetals, and the semi-metals, or the metalloids. I would remember, I'd remember that term particularly. Uh, and metalloids or semi-metals are between the metals and the non-metals. Uh, one side's touching the metals, one side's touching the non-metals, and uh, they're between the metals and the non-metals because they have properties that are both metallic and non-metallic. So where are these that are on the periodic table? Well, our first group, the metals, are going to be here, that left side of the periodic table. Notice up here, I left out hydrogen. Hydrogen is a non-metal. When we talk about metals, there are no gaseous non-metal, or there are no gaseous metals. None of our gases exist as a gas at room temperature, and there's only one, there's only one, which is lead. Um, I don't have my periodic table in front of me. Lead, I would venture, is, or sorry, mercury, sorry, mercury, um, number 80. Mercury is the only liquid, non, is the only liquid metal. So, some other properties of metals. Okay, they're shiny. Okay, that means that they have luster. Okay, if you ever see hear something by lustrous, it means that it's shiny. It's good conductor of heat and electricity, which is why it's not a good idea to stir when you're cooking to use full metal instruments, 
because though that hot that metal spoon that metal spatula whatever is going to heat up because the metal is a good conductor of heat and electricity now they're solid at room temperature except for mercury like i mentioned which is a liquid metals are elements that tend to lose electrons to get an octet in the outer or an, an octet in the outer or the valence shell We'll talk more about octets later, but here's one of the keys. They're going to want to lose electrons. And these elements tend to have less than four electrons in the outer shell, or again, out in the valence shell. So some examples, uh, things like potassium. Uh, potassium reacts violently with water and has to be stored in kerosene or some so other sort of oil to prevent it from exploding. Copper, relatively soft metal, very good conductor. This is what you're. This is what's probably making up the wires that you're using to, that your computers are using or your headphones are using. And mercury, the only metal that exists as a liquid at room temperature, but they're all shiny. They all would be good conductors, and three out of at least two out of these three are solids at room temperature. So what we said is touching the metals on one side are the metalloids. And if you notice this is the stair if you notice these are the staircase. Okay? So we start up here with boron. Now we're going to skip aluminum. We're going to skip aluminum because we know that aluminum's a metal. But then after boron we have silicon and GE, and AS, and SB, and TE, and AT. Now, one of the things that you might now one of the things that you might notice on your periodic table is there is oftentimes a very a, a little bit darker black line that's this little staircase. That's a staircase here. Sorry, AT is there. So this staircase, okay, the staircase splits the metalloids, except again for aluminum. Okay, but think about a can. That's most often cans are made out of aluminum. That's not a metalloid. That is a metal. But so here are metalloids. These uh, elements tend to have three to five electrons in their outer shell and have properties of both metals and nonmetals. So sometimes they'll, sometimes they'll behave as a metal, sometimes they'll behave as a nonmetal. Example, at some temperatures they may be good conductors of heat and electricity, at other, temp at other times they may be not good conductors of heat and electricity. And then finally, on the right side of our periodic table, we have our nonmetals. And notice again, this is going to include hydrogen, including hydrogen, which is all the way over on our left side. And carbon, the graphite and pencilite, is a great example of a nonmetallic element. Nonmetals tend to be poor conductors of heat and electricity. They tend to be brittle. They lack luster. And many are gases. Some are solids, okay, and bromine is the only liquid nonmetal at room temperature. They're going to tend to gain electrons when forming ions, and again, we'll talk about ions a little bit later. And these elements tend to have five or more electrons in their outer shell, in their valence shell. Some examples of nonmetals would be sulfur. Sulfur. Sulfur was once known as brimstone, very characteristic smell. Uh, if you've ever lit a match, if you've ever lit a match, uh, that smell that you get from that match is burning, sulf is burning sulfur. There is phosphorus, okay, a fairly un a fairly reactive nonmetal. And carbon, graphite's not the only pure form of carbon. Diamonds 
are also carbon. The color comes from imp the color of diamonds comes from impurities caught within the crystal structure. So take a second to uh, take a second to review what we've talked about. Carbon is a nonmetal. The vertical columns are groups, and the region on the periodic table are nonmetals.